Hi, DPC. As we come to look at Romans 11, verses 11 to 32, let's ask that God would be with us. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak clearly to us through your word today, and that by your spirit you would help us to understand this passage and to know how to live as your people. Amen. Last Sunday we saw that God did not reject his people, Israel, because even in Paul's day there was a remnant of Jews who trusted in Jesus. But that leaves us with the question, has God finished with the rest of the Jews? Are the numbers of Jewish Christians destined to get smaller and smaller as God turns his attention to the Gentiles? Many Christians over the past two millennia have certainly thought so. They've seen unbelieving Jews as the enemy of the church. God is done with them. Sadly, history is littered with examples of anti-Semitism. Even the great reformer Martin Luther wrote some horrible things about Jews after they resisted his gospel preaching. It can be easy to think that Israel has had her day and that Jews should either be ignored or avoided. Yet, Paul's message is very clear in this chapter that God is not finished with the Jews. He still has a plan for Israel, and so Gentile Christians ought not to look down on them. But what does that mean? Some Christians think it means leaving the Jews alone because sharing the gospel with them is racist and denies their spiritual heritage, and, and God will deal with them as he wants to. Other Christians think that it means embracing Jewish traditions and practices, even observing the law. And still other Christians think it means fully endorsing the modern nation of Israel. In fact, it's quite common among American evangelicals in particular to believe that if you don't want to look down on the Jews, you must support Israeli politics. This is one reason why Donald Trump has been so popular for moving the American embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem two years ago, uh, and for being involved just this past week with the peace deal between Israel and Bahrain. Now, I don't know what should happen in the Middle East, (laughs) but Paul has some helpful ideas on how it is that Christians should view unbelieving Jews today and how they should view the future of Israel as a people. And it will lead us to a very different response than the ones I've just mentioned. So let's start by looking at Paul's first idea. God's hardening of Israel is purposeful and not final. We saw last week in verse 7 that while some of the Jews in Paul's day believed in Jesus, the rest were hardened in unbelief. Now Paul shows us how this will accomplish God's plan for Israel. There's a three-part process that he refers to several times. Jews are hardened so that Gentiles can then believe in Jesus as their Messiah. But this then leads to the Jews themselves coming to believe as well. Check out verses 11 to 15 in Romans 11, where you can see this process mentioned twice. I'll read it out for us. Again I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry, in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? First, we see that Israel's hardening leads to salvation for Gentiles, which entails great riches. It was always God's plan that people from every nation would be saved. And this would be partly accomplished through Israel's rejection of their God. We actually see this played out in Paul's mission strategy. Whenever he arrived at a new city, he would go to the synagogue first and tell them about Jesus. And while some would accept Christ, the rest would oppose him. And so in response to their hardness to the gospel, Paul would then go to the Gentiles. This is a clear example of how the stumbling of Israel leads to riches for the Gentiles. It's why the church didn't remain just a Jewish church, but a church that included Jews and Gentiles. But this stumbling is not permanent. Paul kept going to the Jews because he knew something else. The salvation of the Gentiles leads to salvation-inducing envy. For Israel. 
And this really cuts to the heart of these verses. Paul is proving that Israel did not stumble beyond recovery. That's because they can still be saved, which is the third part of the process that Paul repeatedly points to in our passage. In verses 11 and 14, Paul wants the Jews to be envious so that they will turn to Jesus. He knows that some will see the Gentiles living out the messianic blessings of the kingdom, which will snap them out of their spiritual stupor and lead them to embrace Christ. And this will be of even greater benefit. Uh, In verse 12, Paul says, But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? If stumbling Jews result in blessings for the world, then how much more blessings will come when Jews return to God? Then in verse 15, Paul says that individual Jews being rejected by God led to people all over the world hearing the message that brings reconciliation with God. So then imagine how wonderful it will be when individual Jews are accepted again by God. Paul says it is greater riches and indeed life from the dead. Now, what does that mean? In one sense, it could simply mean that spiritually dead Jews will find themselves raised from the dead. But in another sense, it could refer to the general resurrection of all believers at the end of time. If the rejection of the Jews kicked off a phase in history where the gospel brought peace to the wider world, then surely their full inclusion and acceptance will usher in the final phase of history where eternal life is fully realized and the world is restored to life. This is the ultimate end goal of the three-part process. So in one sense, These parts describe the flow of salvation history between the first coming of Christ and his future second coming. It seems to point towards a time when the full inclusion of Israel will will occur, perhaps revealed in a great influx of Jewish converts. But it also describes how God uses these three parts in our own day to save individual Jews. It's a present day cycle as well as an overarching scheme. This clearly shows that God has not rejected his people Israel and that their current stumbling has not led to a permanent hardening. God's not done with them. And so Gentile Christians ought not to look down on the Jews. Paul strengthens this argument by going on to say that God joins Gentiles to Israel to form one people like branches grafted into an olive tree. You'll see that's the next point on our sermon outline. Have a look at verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Holiness comes from being attached to that which is holy. Israel is God's holy nation, and so being connected to her is what makes individual believers holy. If a portion of dough is considered holy, then the rest must be too. It's like when you go to the supermarket and they offer you a free sample of cake or biscuits or cheese. And you know that if the sample tastes good, then the rest will taste good too. Paul is saying that God hasn't turned his back on Israel and created a new people called the church. Rather, the church is the continuation of Israel under the new covenant established by Jesus. And the foundational root of the church is thoroughly Jewish. God promised to bless the world through Abraham and his family, which means it's only by being connected to this family through faith that we can receive those blessings today. So let's look at the olive tree picture to understand this better. Uh, Paul says in verse 16 that holy roots lead to holy branches. That's because branches draw sap from roots. They are dependent upon them. In this illustration that Paul's giving us, the roots, I think, are the Jewish patriarchs. Uh, Paul says in chapter 9 that uh, the people of Israel had a great advantage because their ancestors were Abraham, Jacob and Isaac. These forefathers or patriarchs had received wonderful promises from God, which had continued down through that family. And now have a look at verse 28 of chapter 11. As far as the gospel is concerned, 
they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. Israel still has a place in God's plan because of his commitment to the patriarchs. Being connected to them brings blessing to people, just like branches being connected to a tree root. In Paul's illustration about the olive tree, branches are individual people. Have a look at verses 17 and 18 of Romans 11. If some of the branches have been broken off, and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. Can you see the picture Paul has in mind? If the people of Israel are an olive tree, the patriarchs are the roots, and individual Jews are the branches. But how is it the Gentiles can join this Jewish tree? By faith, faith in Jesus. Have a look at verses 19 to 21. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. This olive tree illustration is really helpful and conveys two important truths. The first is the unity of God's people. Salvation and eternal blessings ultimately come through being connected to God's holy people who have a Jewish foundation or root. The church does not replace Israel and the church is not an alternative means for salvation. Israel still exists today in the form of ethnic Jews across the world, but not all of these Jews are part of God's redeemed people. Those who reject Jesus are cut off. Yet a remnant has always remained. Just like in Elijah's days we saw last week when there were still 7,000 branches attached to the holy olive tree. The second truth Paul is conveying is that anyone can be grafted into the olive tree if they have faith in Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Jews can be reattached and Gentiles can be grafted in like wild olive branches. Verse 23 shows us that the hardening of the Jews is not permanent. And listen to verse 24 as Paul speaks to Gentile Christians. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Not only is Israel important, but when a Jew becomes a Christian, it's the most natural thing they could do. It's the realisation of their identity and heritage. This links back to our earlier point that the salvation of the Jews means even greater blessings for the world. And also this relates to something that Paul wrote right back at the start of his letter. This is chapter 1, verse 16, and I'm sure many of you know it. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. We might be tempted to think that Paul is speaking about a timeline here. You know, the gospel went to the Jews first and then the Gentiles. But in light of this chapter, I think Paul is saying that the gospel belongs first and foremost to the Jews. When a Jew becomes a Christian, their spiritual state is lining up with their physical heritage. Now, I've spent many hours thinking about this passage, this illustration of an olive tree, and I've tried to look for other theological truths, try to see how it fits with my sort of bigger understanding of the Bible. But what I've learned is that we must not push this illustration too far. So this is just a warning, just in case you're trying to think about other questions. Uh, all illustrations are limited, and this one can't answer every, uh, every question we might have about salvation. Uh, maybe even the perseverance of the saints, the relationship between the invisible and visible people of God, and so on. So let's be content with the idea that there is one people of God with a Jewish root that people are joined to by faith. Well, after describing this picture, Paul then looks to the culmination of God's plan. 
And so in verses 25 to 32, we see God's future plan for Israel, which is the next major point we're going to look at. So let's start with verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Jews has come in. What we learn here about God's future plan for Israel is that Israel's hardening will continue until all elect Gentiles are saved. This really just summarizes what we've already looked at so far. What's new, though, is the idea that there is a full number of Gentiles that God intends to save into his people and that Israel will remain hardened until that occurs. The Jews believed that their full redemption and restoration would lead to a vast number of Gentiles turning to the Lord. But the mystery Paul has revealed is that Israel will only be restored after the conversion of the Gentiles. But what will happen at the end of this time of hardening for Israel? Well, we need to turn to verse 26. And the first part says this, And in this way, all Israel will be saved. What does Paul mean by all Israel? Well, this is where Christians disagree, and it can be a bit confusing. It seems to me, though, that Paul is saying that a key aspect of God's future plan for Israel is that through God's three-part process, all elect ethnic Jews will be saved. We've already seen how the hardening of the Jews leads to the salvation of Gentiles, which then leads to salvation-inducing envy in certain Jews. This is what Paul means when he says, in this way. It's by this unexpected strategy that Israel will be saved. Uh, Some people think that there will be an end to Gentile salvation and then there will be a time of mass Jewish salvation. But it would seem kind of odd that God would stop saving Gentiles. And so I suspect this hardening will continue right up until the second coming of Christ. And so by this process, all Israel will be saved. But what does Paul mean by Israel? Uh, Some people think... Paul's actually speaking about spiritual Israel, which means the church made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. However, in the whole of Romans, Paul only uses the word Israel here in chapters 9 to 11. And in these chapters, he's clearly speaking about ethnic Jews. It'd be pretty odd right at the end to imply a new meaning. So Paul must be thinking of ethnic Jews. But how many of them? Does does all mean every single Jew that's ever lived? Well, surely not, because many of them rejected Jesus, the only means for salvation. So does Paul mean every single Jew who will be alive at a certain future point? Maybe there will be a great influx of millions of Jews just prior to the second coming of Christ. Well, this is certainly what many Christians believe, since they argue that Israel's hardening will end once the full number of Gentiles are saved. But again, this might imply that there'll be a time period in which Gentiles are no longer saved. Also, to insist that all Israel means every Jew alive at a certain point ignores the fact that many past Jews weren't saved. And let's not forget that Romans 9 verse 6 says that not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. I personally think that there will be a great influx of Jewish believers towards the end. But ultimately, we can't say for sure how many Jews will be saved. Uh, What we do know is that God saves all whom he chooses. And so if God elects to save every ethnic Jew in the future, then he's free to do that. Which leads to our final point under God's future plan for Israel. That all of this, everything we've been looking at so far, is in line with God's word. God's faithfulness, and God's impartiality. Uh, First, Paul says in verses 26 and 27 that the salvation of all Israel is backed up by the Old Testament. Have a look. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Paul fuses two quotes from Isaiah 59, verses 20 to 21, and Isaiah 27, verse 9. And they both show how God will bring an end to his judgment upon Israel and will forgive individual Jews. 
So this plan for Israel that Paul's taught us about fits with God's word, with his promises in the Old Testament. It also fits with God's faithfulness. Look at verses 28 and 29. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Even though Jews reject the gospel, God is not done with Israel. He made promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And so God is still committed to saving Jews. He can't undo his call to them to be his people. And finally, God's plan to save all Israel is in line with God's impartiality in salvation. Let's look at verses 30 to 32. Just as you, who were at one time disobedient to God, have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Now let's be clear. Paul is not arguing that God will save all individual humans. Rather, he's saying that all sorts of people can and will be saved. And in line with God's freedom in salvation, he is free to reject disobedient Jews, but he's also free to have mercy on disobedient Jews. In fact, God is well within his rights to save more Jews than Gentiles if he so chooses, because after all, Israel is his chosen nation. Now, some people might think, well, that's just God showing favoritism. You know, God's not being partial. Uh, God's not being impartial. But we actually need to remember that God freely chose Israel in the first place by his own choice. And so he can freely choose to show more love to them if he so desires. God is sovereign. Hopefully you can see Paul's overall argument here. God's not done with Israel, so Gentile Christians ought not to look down on the Jews. So let's spend some time now thinking about how Gentile Christians can respond to Romans 11. And I say Gentile Christians because the reality is that most, if not all of you who are listening to this sermon, are not Jewish by descent. This passage is written specifically for us, and so we need to especially take heed. The first response Paul wants us to make is to remember that you are attached to a Jewish root by faith. The church does not replace Israel, and there is only one people of God. So we must not look down on the Jews. So surely it goes without saying that there is no place for anti-Semitism in God's church. And I suspect that's probably not something that we would struggle with in particular. But we might be inclined to ignore unbelieving Jews or maybe be a bit suspicious of them. You know, they reject Jesus as their Messiah, so why should we care about them? Well, Paul reminds us that they are part of the Jewish family that we benefit from. So some people think this means we should celebrate Jewish culture by observing their spiritual holidays and learning Hebrew. I mean, you're free to do that, but it won't make you any closer to God, and it's not what Paul has in mind. Instead, we should honour our Jewish spiritual heritage by loving the Jewish scriptures, which we call the Old Testament and by enjoying the covenantal promises that are being fulfilled in us. And let me say that honouring our Jewish heritage also doesn't mean that we must support modern-day Israel. Now, while it certainly is a blessing from God that Jews still exist today, there is no theological obligation to support the modern-day nation-state of Israel. Some Christians believe that the church should be campaigning to secure Israel's borders, to rebuild the temple and get all Jews in the world to live back in the land. In fact, there are people who will pay money, who will sponsor Jews to move back to Israel, kind of in this thought of we will actually action God's plan on his behalf. These people are convinced this is the only way that Jesus will return. But this passage and others show that our primary concern should be sharing the gospel with Jews. 
It's through Jews and Gentiles becoming Christians that God's plan will be fully realized. That is when Jesus will come back. In fact, this leads to our next point. Paul wants you to respond to Romans 11 by making Jews jealous through your Christian life. This is a key aspect of the three-part process. Paul hoped that his missionary labors amongst the Gentiles would stir up his own people to investigate Christ and come to saving faith. Again, some Christians get confused and think that this means adopting Jewish practices like observing the Passover and only eating kosher food. In fact, I once knew a Christian who refused to eat pork because he felt that was how to be faithful to God and that if only Australia would obey the law of Israel, we would be blessed as a nation. But we don't help Jews by pointing them back to the law, which can never save. Rather, we point them to the fulfillment of the law in Jesus Christ and show them that the church now experiences the beginning of the blessings promised to Abraham. Jesus died to reconcile humans to God and in so doing secured the renewal of the earth, which is the ultimate promised land. We can show unbelieving Jews that their hope does not lie in the Middle East, but in Jesus and the future that he offers. Also, we can live out today the blessings secured for us. We can show them that We have peace with God and we don't need to endlessly sacrifice to him so as to maintain forgiveness or earn his favor. We can show them how we treasure the word of God and that we enjoy a personal relationship with him as we daily pray to him as our heavenly father. We can show them that we are the new temple of God because the spirit of God lives in us, which transforms how we live. Surely this should motivate our church to keep growing in love and unity and godliness and holiness so that any Jew who visits our gatherings will be able to see a community overflowing with grace and mercy. They will see us and say, this is what God promised my ancestors and it's found in the church of Jesus. But the truth is, there aren't many Jews living in our area. And so this may not happen very often. So a third way we can respond to Romans 11 is to support mission to the Jews. As I said earlier, there is a theological priority for mission to the Jews. The gospel is first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. If we simply use demographics, then the Jews will never get a look in when we plan our strategy and our financial support because they're such a minority. According to the 2016 census, there were only 218 Jews living in our council area of Darabin. So it it would make no practical sense for us to set up Jewish outreach in Darabin or kind of be pouring all of our efforts into Jewish mission in our location. But Paul says that the gospel is first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. He says that God isn't finished with Israel. He says, says there is a fullness of Gentiles to be saved, but also a fullness of Jews to be saved. So it can help to think of missions as being two boxes. Uh, One box is mission to the nations and the other is mission to the Jews. It doesn't mean that we will give equally to both, but it ensures that we don't neglect the Jews. And this is where demographics can help because they might inform where we can direct our support. For example, the Council of Glen Ira in Melbourne has more than 23,000 Jews. And so maybe you might like to support some churches over in places like Balaclava or Caulfield. Or you can even support a mission agency that focuses, focuses on Jewish people, such as Christian Witness to Israel. You can search online for their Australian website. I've been in touch with them and they've told me that there is a new website being launched uh, later this month or maybe next month. Um, Their leadership is made up of some well-known evangelical reformed people in Australia, uh, and they've recently appointed some new missionaries to work in Australia. In fact, let me finish by telling you about the international CEO of Christian Witness to Israel, Joseph Steinberg. I heard him speak a couple of years ago, and he tells the story of how he grew up Jewish but didn't know God. 
He had a Gentile friend who was a Christian. And this guy had a vibrant relationship with God. And when Joseph heard about Jesus from this friend, he found himself feeling jealous of him. And so he wanted to know how he could enjoy those blessings. It was so encouraging to hear the testimony of a Jew who actually experienced salvation-inducing envy. It shows that even today, God has not rejected his people Israel, and they have not stumbled beyond recovery. So as Gentile Christians, we ought not to look down on the Jews, but rather pray for them and point them to Christ, their Messiah, our Messiah. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we praise you for your wonderful plan. We praise that you praise you that uh, you still plan to save uh, many Jews. Uh, we don't know exactly what this will look like, uh, but please help us to know that what counts is that we share the gospel with them as we're able. Uh, please stir us up to support mission to the Jews, but also stir us up to be living out our Israel, uh, our spiritual heritage that's found in being connected to Israel. Help us to celebrate what you have done for us. Uh, celebrate the promises made to the patriarchs, Lord. Help us to live out uh, the faith that we have. Amen.